Welcome to Kuwait's Industrial Automation and Control Systems Cybersecurity Conference, KIAX Cybersecurity 2014, 25 through 26 May 2014. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC. So ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to be fast tracking over to our panel discussion today. We are delighted to have back on stage Eric Byers from Tofino Systems, and he is going to be our moderator. Eric, welcome back. Great to have you. Eric is going to be doing a panel discussion entitled Trends in Technology and Practice for the IACS Security. And the great thing is that we're going to be running for about 50 minutes. And all of that 50 minutes is going to be very interactive between panelists and you, the audience. Now, our five panelists are listed as such. And if I could ask you just to do a royal wave when I mention your name, then the audience will know who you are. So we've got Earl Perkins. Give them a little wave, Earl, who is the Research Vice President of System Security and Risk at Gartner. We've got Jeff Sindel. There he is, Jeff Sindel, Global Cybersecurity Business Leader at Honeywell Process Solutions, HPS. Um, we've got Jeff Potter. There he is, Jeff Potter, Director of Security Architecture at Emerson Process Management. We also have Arjan Maijer. Arjan, the Royal Wave, that's right, consultant of ICS Security at Hudson Cybertech. And last but not least, Joel, Joel Langle, there he is on the end. And he is ICS Cybersecurity Specialist at Infrastructure Defense Security Services. I'm now going to be handing over to our moderator, Eric, and I believe that you have quite a good bio on all of them. You're going to be telling us a little bit more about them. Ladies and gentlemen, do welcome Eric, his panel discussion. OK. Um, get some slides up here. I think we've got a panel slide. Okay, well, that's happening. Uh, maybe it's a magic button I have to push here. Perfect, okay. All right, so uh, today's panel is going to be about trends in practice and technology for uh, industrial automation and control system security. Um, we have some, as you just learned, some real experts, and I'll be talking about them a little bit more in a moment. Um, people who really have had years and years of experience both in security and in control systems. Um, and they'll, uh, you'll be able to ask them questions. Um, but before you can we, uh, start asking questions, and by the way, we're going to have lots of time for questions. This isn't going to be like the rest of the talks where you only have a minute. We're going to have almost an hour of questions here. So uh, start thinking about your questions, things you want to know. Now, uh, what we're going to do is uh, each of the five speakers are going to get two minutes just to say about what's really important to them, what they believe in, what their philosophies. They've got two slides in two minutes, and we're going to go through those so that you know who's on the stage, so you know not just a, a, a name or a company, but really what matters to them and what they, what they believe in. And then it's your turn. And I'm going to encourage you to um, Stand up, pick up that mic, put your hand up for the mic, and ask questions, uh, and really get this going, make this interactive. If you're not used to asking questions, or if you're uncomfortable at asking questions, then write it down and hand it to a uh, question to one of the organizers, and it'll be fed up here for me to read. Or it'll be, um, or somehow we'll get it read out. But we encourage you to ask questions using the mic. And of course, when you ask questions with the mic, state your name and state who you're affiliated with. Okay, so as I mentioned, the topic is trends and practices in technology for industrial control and automation systems. And really the scope when we started to put this all together was how can we share the insights through, uh, for the best practices that will address the evolving threat? Because as we've seen in all the presentations today, things are not getting better, they're getting worse. The threat is evolving. So how are, is industry going to address those changes? 
So, as we mentioned, uh, we've already introduced the speakers. I'll go through them again in a minute. Um, but before I uh, hand it over to the panel and get the panel involved, I'll little, give you a little bit of background on what I think really matters in industrial control systems, really just to kick this off. Uh, and first of all, I think it's really important that we start to learn what our hidden assumptions are. I believe that for uh, any system, if you're trying to secure it, you've got to understand what the assumptions are that are, are making your system work. And we make all sorts of assumptions. And we also uh, need to realize that sometimes the assumptions in IT are not the same assumptions um, that we have in ICS. Because those assumptions then start to color the way equipment gets configured, what's the default, the way it works. So a uh, good example um, is the use of passwords. And the way you can use passwords on my laptop is, has a whole bunch of built-in assumptions versus the way you can use passwords, say, in a safety management system. I also think that we need to start to whitelist the network. And by that, I mean we let too much stuff on the network. We just let any old packet zip around on our network. We need to start making it very restricted, first of all, to the protocols. We have to have a very clear understanding of what protocols are running. But more than that, we've got to understand what they're doing. And we've got to get it narrower and narrower. We've all heard about whitelisting applications, but I think we need to whitelist the network. Um, we also need a better view of what's happening on the plant floor. I currently believe that very few companies actually know what's going on when it comes to the traffic levels, uh, the uh, packet types, the type, who's talking to who on their operations floors. They're just trusting that the network is running correctly. And lastly, and probably most important of my beliefs is that uh, complexity is the enemy of security. And as we go forward, if we make this more complicated and more confusing, we're not going to make it secure. So that's what I believe. Now I'm going to uh, hand it over to Jeff Bahader. Um, as uh, you know, Jeff is the Director of uh, Security Architecture at Emerson uh, Process Management. And I've known Jeff uh, for, I think, about 15 years. I first met him when he was uh, leading um, wireless development at Emerson, uh, where uh, this is way back before security was even on the radar. And Jeff started talking to me about doing uh, a full in-depth security analysis of wireless. This was, uh, this is uh, uh, industrial wireless. And Jeff was a real visionary. To do something like that back in the early 2000s was really unusual. And Jeff's always been a visionary. He's worked for um, uh, Texaco, for Chevron. He managed uh, worldwide upstream oil and gas projects. Um, and today, he's very, very uh, heavily involved in uh, setting the security direction for security architectures at Emerson. But he also does an awful lot of volunteer work with standards bodies, in particular uh, the ISA 99, which we had a whole slideshow about earlier, uh, and their um, standards called the IEC ISA uh, 62443. Um, he's also been very involved in the NIST framework. Um, if you want, to if you have a question about standards, if you're curious about standards for this industry, Jeff's one of the people you really need to have to talk to. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to hear about what Jeff believes is important. Wow, thank you. And if you, and if you don't care about standards, then that's fine too. I won't, I'm, I'm, my feelings won't be hurt. So um, <clears throat> as, as Eric says, I'm the Director of Security Architecture for Emerson Process Management. So what does that mean? So just as a reminder to people, what's under the Emerson Process Management umbrella, that would be the Delta V systems, Ovation systems, uh, Fisher valves, uh, Rosemount sensors, and micromotion uh, meters, uh, all our different actuators and, and, and valve and, and system and, and sensor products. So it's quite a, quite a wide portfolio, which means I have really tiny dash lines all over the place. Um, now, I did kind of a boring thing, Eric. You know, instead of uh, expressing what my views are, I looked at what the uh, organizers suggested as, um, as possible topic areas, and I tried to answer them. So maybe I'm the right person to start off with, you know. Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, one of the things they said is new technology and practices. And um, what I've really enjoyed about today so far is over and over and over again, and I'm going to just hammer it away some more, is the two P's are capitalized and the T is lowercase. So I absolutely agree that the issues that we have largely are people and processes and practices and procedures. And, and, and I'm an engineer and I love talking about technology. We all love talking about technology. 
but we have to make sure that we don't get sucked into a, a discussion about technology and, and fall in love with some new shiny object which really isn't the, uh, the big solution set. So one of the things that I was, I was suggesting as, and it's, it doesn't sound like it's new technology, but it's a new practice. Start ripping out a lot of our old archaic stuff, and, and in particular focus on some of the ancillary equipment. Don't just focus on the actual controllers and stuff, but look at a lot of the old switches and, and, and gateways and, and routers and stuff that we have. So, um, you know, we need, and I, I absolutely uh, agree that we need better collaboration with our corporate IT groups, there's no doubt about that. Um, virtualization, I think there's some interesting things going on in the area of virtualization. It isn't, again, a silver bullet as somebody was talking to earlier, but I think there's a lot of really good things there, particularly if we're looking at the aspects of uh, resiliency of our systems if a penetration actually occurs. I think there's some very, very powerful things that virtualization might be able to do. And then finally, um, passive vulnerability scanning is just a kind of a generic term. Uh, Tenable's got something, uh, McAfee I think's got some things. I think there's some very interesting things, that I, and I think the, the, the importance there is the, the aspect of passive versus active. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, the, the organizers asked us if there was some sort of trendy smoke and mirror topic that we wanted to point out, and in my view, one of those would fall into the category of real-time global threat response where you, you've got somebody from, from rem some remote location automatically updating your IDS and IPS signatures. I'm really, really uncomfortable with that general concept. Um, I think there needs to be some sort of uh, staging going on there. That's just my opinion. Uh, threat landscape against IECS uh, a, a decade from now. Okay, I have no clue what's gonna happen a decade from now. If I did, I'd, I'm not paid enough. But I will say, it's kind of interesting, I was looking around and I was looking at these $500 kits where you can buy a drone, uh, hexcopter or octocopter that lifts about 15 kilograms and you don't even have to control it. You can just put in a latitude, longitude. And I, it just frightens, this, frightens me to death thinking about what could be done with a bunch of these little drones each carrying in 15 kilos of, of C4 or something like that. I, wow. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's not a cyber thing, but hey, we'll, we'll do a little physical security just for fun here. And then finally, in terms of practices and technologies, um, you know, I definitely think there's, a, for the future, a decade from now, um, you know, you look at with Intel having bought McAfee and they've also bought um, Wind River, which is the VxWorks thing. I think, you know, and I'm not trying to single them out, but I think there's some interesting things where we can integrate security all the way from the chip reset up through boot all the way up to the application that we don't do right now. Um, you know, I'm a wireless guy from way back and I really think that the, the thing that's, that things that we do in wireless uh, where there's a robust joint process and every device is, is clearly identified and authenticated you know, by the system before they're allowed to participate and every message is encrypted between the device and the, and the systems. Uh, I think that's really, really powerful, and if, if we could get that into wire, uh, wired protocols in the next uh, 10 years, that would be great. And then finally, whitelisting all the way down to the end devices, uh, really lock those end devices down. And, you know, uh, I think that's more than two, two minutes, but my apologies. <laughs> that's great. Okay. So our uh, next uh, panelist is uh, Ariane Mayer. Uh, Arian is a security consultant with Hudson Cybertech out of the Netherlands. Um, and he's had a long history uh, in uh, embedded systems and then IC ICS and then MES. Uh, and his area of expertise is security management, security training, and security education. Uh, he's a certified uh, ISA 99 IEC uh, 62443 trainer. Um, and today he really focuses on critical infrastructure industries such as oil and gas or food and pharma and how to make those secure. So I'll uh, give uh, Ariane a chance to tell you about his uh, interests. Perfect. Thank you very much for your kind words, uh, Eric. And uh, again, thank you for the organization to Equate. I think it's a perfect conference with a lot of high-class uh, high speakers and I really liked it so far and I'm happy to be a part of uh, of the presentation set. 
Uh, well, first of all, a bit about myself. My name is Arie Meijer, as Eric already mentioned, and I'm working with Hudson Cybertech as a consultant, uh, which means I'm on a day-to-day basis down with my boots in the ground. I'm really at the customer implementing cybersecurity within the ICS environment. And I think that's a very interesting job because um, you have a lot of things that you should take into account when you go, uh, go implementing ICS security. So, and just to keep try uh, a little bit on the topic, on the discussion of uh, the, this panel. Uh, first of all, a question, what do we see as trends? What are my ideas about the trends that we'll see happening uh, now already and even more in the future? First of all, there will be a tighter integration of IT and OT technologies. We will see that in all our customers, um, both from a techno technological stand of view, but also from an organizational point of view, where IT and OT people trying to work together more and that should be integrated more and that will happen also in the future. And another point that, that we see quite a lot and we will see definitely more in the future is a massive increase in the use of IT protocols within the ICS environment. And not only more of those protocols, like TCPIP, replacing bus systems, but even on to, down to the sensor level. Um, eventually, we will see sensors being equipped with TCPIP more and more, and we will see really an explosion of those devices, which will not, not only be harder to manage, but even creating more ICS security issues that you have to deal with. Uh, along with that, we'll see a grow in data importance. Uh, a lot of organizations trying to get more data out of the systems to increase their efficiency in production and, and be able to get more data and to, to save costs for that. Um, and as we already saw in earlier presentations this morning, we will also see an increase in threats, uh, get more sophisticated and more targeted every day and every month. And what we'll need, I think, is a security by design. And I had already a discussion with some people, what is security by design? And by security by design, I do not only mean security by design for the technical part, but really security by design for also your organization and your employees, because that's a very important part that you design security in, but also in your company processes and in your uh, people with education and training on how to work with ICS security. So basically getting your organization and people into shape. That's an important one. Yes. So, ICS security needs a integrated approach. What is very important, and we saw that already with uh, the people, process, uh, processes, and technology (PPT), but uh, we call it technology, organization, and people. It's very important. As a new thing in technology, one of the things we will see is, for example. Uh, signatureless detection, monitoring on your network, what is going on, and really be able to feel what is going on. Because all too often we see defense happening, defense in depth is a well-known term, what, but what about uh, detection in depth? One very important item. And that needs to be embedded in the organization, um, so that the organization supports the new technologies that will be integrated. Uh, a firewall without proper management procedures will not function as well as a well-managed and well-documented firewall. And on top of that, the people in your organization need to be able to understand those measures and they need to be able to have the right knowledge and the right attitude towards security. So not only awareness, but also an, a knowledge on security te technologies that they can implement. And I think a good starting point is by using standards like the IEC 62443 to help you embed cybersecurity within your organization. And by that I don't mean following it by the letter and being compliant, but using it as a tool to integrate cybersecurity within your organization. So, that having said, I think that's my starting point for the uh, panel. Great, thank you very much. So, our next panelist is Earl Perkins. He's uh, a Research Vice President at Gartner. Um, and Earl's somebody who's had a lot of experience in the trenches. He's worked for uh, um, a lot of the major energy and oil, uh, oil companies. Uh, he worked for Energy, he worked for London Energy, he worked for EDF. Uh, he spent uh, 16 years in energy and utilities, five of them in oil and gas. And then he's also had 12 years as a research analyst in networking security. So he's really seen both sides of the fence. Uh, both the view from being a user, having to be in the trenches, and then also looking outside of what's coming 
and having being able to have that vision of what uh, is coming down the path. So I'll hand it over to Earl, and let's hear what he thinks for the next two minutes. Thank you, Eric. And not only thank you for the sponsors uh, for this event, which is a, it's a privilege to be here, actually, but I also want to thank all of you out there for taking your valuable time during the day to come and to be together and to be able to network together. Hopefully you're finding it useful so far. I think the best way for me to describe, um, I think, things that I am seeing in the industry today is to take you on a very short tour, first of all, of the coverage that I do at Gartner. Um, I cover what is known as the operational technology space. Now, the OT name, we try to apply uh, to cover most of the industrial automation and control environment, but it also goes, and it extends beyond that as well. There are some aspects that you're going to and have already heard about today regarding areas related to things like physical security. And there are also, of course, the issues related to IT. And so like Arjun said, we're going to be looking at both IT and OT issues. I tend to look at it from a broader perspective related to governance or what you would think of maybe as the soft issues. Governance, process, strategy, best practices, trends, we're always on the lookout, I believe, for companies that are showing a level of innovation in the way they're approaching some of the issues that are associated with this. And the previous speaker actually touched upon the topic of the Internet of Things. I confess that I am an analyst that also covers the Internet of Things in addition to OT. And what I often tell people is that operational technology was the Internet of Things before it was cool to be the Internet of Things. Um, we were using some of the technologies that are being bragged about today for the past 30 or even 40 years in terms of at least process. So that's something to remember when we're looking at some of these issues. Some of them are very new, but some of them are very old. What do I believe in? I believe that we're in the midst of a cultural revolution. That's essentially what I believe in, that we're seeing IT and OT cultures having to learn to assimilate in some respects and to appreciate the differences in others. Uh, I also believe that this idea of IT, OT convergence, alignment and integration is going to continue to take place. We will not be able to stop it. And the reason why is it makes sense from an economic perspective and from a strategic perspective to bring together what may have been, at least in some areas, to be parallel and even competing strategies. Doesn't make sense to continue to do that. I also believe that we are now entering a phase of what I call ruthless prioritization. We're going to be put into a situation where the level of threat and the complexity of the issues we face is going to require us to be quite, um, not only circumspect, but I think quite ruthless in the way we choose those areas that we need to work on first. And I think finally, it's an area of balancing. We're going to have to balance not only the issues of safety, reliability, and security, which sometimes, by the way, conflict, correct? We're also going to have to begin to look at the idea of balancing prevention with detection. Let's face it, we won't be able to stop all of the attacks. So anyone in the room that thinks that we can build a perfect system, then you're in the wrong conference. We can, however, improve our detection capabilities where we can make those particular attacks, those successful attacks, to have minimal impact upon us. And that is as worthy a goal as trying to prevent them. And then I think finally we need to balance IT security adaptation, meaning those security technologies from the IT world that we must adapt to OT for OT security to be successful versus those new technologies that are specific to OT that will have to be developed. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So um, my next presenter, our next panelist is uh, Jeff Sindel sitting beside me here. Uh, Jeff's the global uh, cybersecurity business leader for Honeywell Process Solutions. And his job, uh, he's responsible for the business growth and investment strategy for Honeywell Industrial Cybersecurity Solutions and Services. And he leads the group there uh, in the uh, Honeywell Process Solutions Industrial uh, um, Solutions Organization. Now, he's had a lot of experience as well, like all our panelists, 20 years in tech technology as a corporate executive, an entrepreneur. Um, but he's also had the uh, chance to work in a lot of different areas, uh, cybersecurity, cyber defense, signals intelligence, big data analytics, telecommunications, data networking, internet. So he brings a really broad range of understanding of different technologies, uh, different industries uh, to bear on the problem. So I'll hand it to Jeff to hear his vision. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, what I'm gonna focus on is talking about uh, best business practices. And there's been a lot of great discussion uh, by the presenters earlier about risk. And when, when I look at the challenge and, and work with leading customers and, and, and we make recommendations, it's to start with uh, risk tolerance. And so it's all about understanding what your risk tolerance is, what risks you're willing to take, um, and being explicit about that, not just talking about risk, but documenting and understanding what are you willing to endure when it comes to availability, when it comes to criticality, looking at systems, looking at nodes, looking at people, looking at employees, vendors, and, and, and alike. And then it's once you have that baseline understanding of what uh, your risk tolerance is, it's to identify your gaps against that. And it's to, it's to measure those and then manage those on a continual and ongoing basis. It's not to do an assessment uh, every year, but it's to continually look at those risk measures. Um, and once that risk tolerance has been identified, uh, then we find it, you, you know, it's all about implementation. And dealing with this great challenge of cybersecurity, uh, many times we're asked, you know, where should we start? How should we start? Uh, how should we staff this? How should we approach it? And we found a great parallel uh, in looking at, at cybersecurity through the lens of safety. And when we talk about cybersecurity, we talk about implementing it with the rigor of your safety program. And so that cuts across everything you're doing. That has to do with staffing and resourcing and budgets. That's having a chief security officer in place. That's having dedicated expertise and experts uh, across the organization. It goes to awareness and training, um, touching employees across, uh, across the plants and the enterprise. Moves on to controls, both engineered, technical, as well as operational. And then finally goes on uh, to monitoring, auditing, and reporting. And as you're implementing those controls and these programs with the, uh, the, the rigor of safety, it's very, very important to take an end-to-end -end and continuous approach. Um, and so while there's been a lot of focus in the past uh, on protection, it's absolutely critical to be focused as well on detection and response. Many people have talked so far the, the, uh, the, the attacks are getting more severe, they're getting more sophisticated. We have to assume on a go-forward basis that we will be compromised, there will be issues, and detection and response, therefore, are absolutely critical. Um, when we talk about end-to-end, -end, what am I talking about? It's assessments and audits, it's architecture and design, it's network controls, endpoint controls, situational awareness, which is becoming incredibly important, and then finally, as I touched on, response and recovery. And it's not an event or a series of events, but it requires a continuous focus. And that's both organizationally, process-wise, and, and the like. Um, in the areas of emerging technology, I see some exciting changes and developments in uh, situational awareness. And those are developing tools uh, in systems that will help identify risk, um, help measure those risks, provide decision support, and, uh, and finally, couple that with external vulnerability and threat intelligence. So thank you. Thanks very much. Now, uh, last uh, but definitely not least, a <laughs> uh, good friend of mine, Joel Langle. He's the president of Infrastructure uh, Defense Security Services. Joel's been, uh, got now, I guess, over almost 30 years now that you've been in uh, automation specifying, <coughs> designing, uh, commissioning, maintaining some of the largest automation systems uh, in the world, uh, heavily in the oil and gas. He's worked in over 30 different countries. Uh, he was involved in a lot of the uh, 
oil and gas refineries uh, built from 1991 to uh, 2005, uh, including a lot uh, in this country. And he's been in Kuwait and uh, all over the GCC uh, since the 1990s. He knows uh, your region, the issues that you are involved in uh, very well because he's been here so many times. Um, so he really has seen this industry uh, from all sides as, uh, uh, as an automation vendor, uh, as the end user, as the supplier, as the system integrator, and now uh, he's here to uh, give you uh, guidance and, and be of assistance to really help um, steer uh, you in making the decisions that are going to matter for control system security. So I'll hand it over to Joel. Thank you, Eric. Well, what's that? One moment. Not to mention a great author of a book on this subject as well. If you haven't read it, you should. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's really an honor to come back here because as I looked around the audience, I re recognize a lot of the, the customers represented here, but many of you might not recognize me because I'm a bit grayer, a bit thinner, a bit heavier. But I originally came, my first trip to Kuwait was in the 1994-95 era when I introduced KMPC to the world of Unix in the DCS world. And sure enough, about three years after that, I returned over to introduce KMPC again to the migration to the Windows world. So for a great deal of time, I was pretty much the back office technical architect for a lot of projects while I was at Honeywell and have been involved and seen a lot over my career. And one thing I've seen is that in general, in this post-2010 world, right, there's a little inner, inner circle of us that promised to never use the S word. Post-2010, we've realized that security is now at least a word in the vocabulary of many people. What we're starting to see now is that it's creating what I would call islands of excellence. So the Honeywells and the Emersons and the Bechtels and the various integrators around the world all are starting to take cybersecurity seriously. But what we're seeing is that these islands of excellence have resulted in the need to build bridges to connect these islands. Because a lot of people don't understand the number of different parties that actually touch an automation project from conception to completion and then ongoing maintenance and support. All of you do because we've been here. I worked on the original Equate project. I worked on the Shuaiba rebuild. I worked on the Rostinur refinery upgrade in Saudi Arabia. We realize that there's so many people involved that the challenge now is getting everybody to figure out how we can overlap and overlay our cybersecurity practices and start to address not just the obvious vulnerabilities that may be inherent to the technology, but the vulnerabilities that are introduced by the people as we start to put these systems together. And that is a challenge. That is a very difficult challenge because there are so many people, there are so many influencers along the way. One thing that I believe, situational awareness and continuous monitoring are a couple areas that I do a lot of research in. They've been talked about earlier. But the one thing that is very important is that we have to realize that there is a high likelihood that we will be hit by a cyber event, which means we must have the ability to respond in a rapid, accurate, timely manner. And that's one area that I think you're not going to be able to go to a, a vendor or supplier and buy something from a price list. But the ability to create incident response plans, and more importantly, to practice and rehearse what you would do if a significant event would hit your manufacturing facilities. Because the idea is you're not going to prevent everything. But what you really want to do is you want to contain the situation in order to minimize the consequences that you would see. And because of time, I won't really talk about the last bullet. The technologies that I believe are going to help us get there really start to introduce the concept that you have to realize that you are probably going to be the victim of an event in the future, which means from today's definitions, what you are going to fall victim to would be a zero day in today's terms. And one of the biggest challenges I face as an independent consultant is to teach people to stop looking backwards and look forward. 
and start to design resilient systems, as Jeff was talking uh, at the break <coughs> earlier today with another customer. They have to be resilient so that they're going to be able to tolerate the unknown, something that is likely to happen in the future that really we don't know about today. Another thing that I'm seeing, if you look at the logo that I put on the top of the slide, you will probably know who I am. The one thing that I am very vocal about is the insider. And unfortunately, when I see a lot of external entities come in and talk, they tend to always want to position the threat as being somebody outside your organization. Now, I agree that the originator of the malware, for instance, may be an external entity. The problem is that in almost all cases, the malware is introduced into the architectures by the insider. And most people, when they look at their risk profile on systems, fail to, fail to consider what would happen if an insider did something unintentionally. And again, I do a lot of independent assessments for end users and working with vendors as a subcontractor. That is one of the most common breaches we see. I was at a major oil field in South America. They had a complete system compromise that was introduced by the system integrator. And that particular malware was resident on every one of the engineering tool sets that all of their field engineers had. So they would go throughout the oil field, plug their engineering workstation in, and they would infect the architecture at the lowest point in the architecture. So it didn't start on the internet and work its way in. It started at the wellhead and worked its way out. And that's where I see one of the biggest challenges is thinking about our architecture. I think we all know where the risk lies. Now the key is to actually identify that risk and start to work towards that. And that's why Eric and I work a lot on this concept, which we're starting to deem as a protocol whitelisting approach or a networking whitelisting approach. Because the only way we're really going to detect and contain these events is if we know what's supposed to be occurring on our networks. And more importantly, we prevent or at least alert when anything outside of those particular events occurs. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Eric. OK, thank you very much. So now it's your turn. So uh, we'd like to invite you to uh, put your hand up. If you've got a question, um, we'll send the mic over. And uh, ask the panel some questions. Ask some hard questions. Um, so any questions out there? And also, oh, I see a question over here. And also, you're free to write down if you're, if you're uncomfortable speaking. Uh, you can write down questions and send them up. Hey, Eric, one thing. And if you had a person who you would like to direct it to, please do so. Feel free to do so. Good point. Thanks, Joel. Ladies and gentlemen, reminding you to mention your name, your company, and just your question. Thank you. My name is Andrzej Zolotan from Kuwait Oil Company. So I would like to ask, uh, let's say, maybe a hardest question. Yeah? Uh, I'm representing end user, and in fact, when we are purchasing the system, we are uh, assuming that system is secure, safe, and uh, ready to go. Yeah? Currently, uh, by analyzing what you guys were saying, uh, as let's say, part of uh, uh, problems is also laying in our hands too. So when we can uh, be able to uh, be a dump user, just purchase the system and just use it. <laughs> Who wants to take code? Okay, I'll take a shot at that. <clears throat> About a month ago, Emerson had a Emerson Exchange, our tr internal trade show in Stuttgart. And we had a security meet the experts panel. And a question from the audience was, do we sell a low, medium, and high secure version of Delta V? And I thought that was a really a fascinating question. And the reason why I bring that up in, in re regards to your question is, we sell Delta V. It has a set of capabilities. The customer can decide, based on a risk assessment, which one of those capabilities they want to use, you know, how strong they want the passwords to be, you know, all sorts of other things. Do they want two-factor authentication? There's some auxiliary things that you can do in terms of additional firewalls and stuff. But really, the, 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 you end up with a low, medium, or high version of my company's 
control system based on what you've done at site. So you don't purchase a high security version of our product. You purchase our product and then working with us or your integrator or internally, you then develop the policies and procedures which then ends up with the level of uh, security that you feel is appropriate for your company. And no, you will never be able to just be dumb and plug it in, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and maybe just to add to that, I mean, at the core, as, as automation vendors, look, we embed security into the systems. We, uh, we design to security standards. Um, but again, um, we're, we're providing to, that, to the customer, and, and in the real live environment, then uh, we'll work with you to ensure you have the right architecture in place. Um, but it's that same, you know, area or joint partnership between end user and vendor to have a successful secure implementation. And I think, um, as I already mentioned, one of the other things is detection. Eventually you can have defense and, and let's say for perhaps that you're, without some knowledge internal to your organization, you can, you can have the defense, but still you want to have detection, know what is going on and to be able to interpret that information and to be able to to base decisions on that, what is going on in your network, and, and be aware of that, you still need some basic knowledge about network and security and, and how to interpret those events. That's such a good opening question, and that gives me an opportunity to ask you all something that I think is equally important. Having kind of been in the triangle, right, I've been a supplier, I've been an end user, I've been an integrator, typically vendors won't give you something that you don't ask for. Because by doing that, you can end up creating systems that become commercially unattractive. So the question I would like to pose all you with just a show of hands, how many of you have actually begun to incorporate cybersecurity requirements in your control system functional specifications? Not writing a separate standalone document, but actually embedding security into the requirements that you're asking people to supply. Put, put your hands up if you... Uh, put your hands up. If, you do, if your company does that. Okay. So that's, that's where we see one of the biggest challenges right now. And I always use a firewall as an example. I'm a Cisco guy, I'll admit it, so I don't, I don't think we have Juniper in here or any of those companies, but a firewall is an inherently secure device. But you have to configure it. And if you happen to put in any, any, any allow rule is the first rule in your firewall, that firewall is no longer implemented securely. And that's why the one thing um, people like Arjan and myself are strongly en encouraging customers like yourself is to begin to incorporate security acceptance testing into your project requirements. So that what you can do is you can start to look at the security deliverable in addition to the functional deliverable of these systems. So, of course, we're going to continue to test our graphics, test our applications, test our I.O. wiring, but now we would like to start to test the security capability of that system. I'd like to, just to add one last piece to that, too. When you asked the question, you know what I thought of when you asked it? I thought of supply chain. I don't know why, but I was thinking about the idea of trusting the supply chain. And what you're asking us essentially is, can I trust the supply chain to provide me with solutions that if they say they can do what they say they do, then fine. And I believe you know, the folks that are working on the standards will tell you that supply chain represents one of the, the most important you know, sticking points for like the latest cybersecurity framework. It's a to-do item for that. So I think, first of all, if I look at it as a supply chain question, um, we have a lot of work to do there to engender trust. I, I would, the comment that Joel had made, the, sometimes I think vendors do try to, if you're on the IT side where I came from originally, they do try to sell you more than you can use. And that is another, that's another scale of the problem is that sometimes you have to dig through the general purpose features of IT security products to find the functions that work for OT. So it, it points out a problem with the culture that I mentioned earlier. The cultures are still very different in the way we approach systems and process and processing. So it'll be an interesting play. 
Okay, do, I think we have another question right down here. Oh, mic on. Yeah, my name is Carl Ruder. I'm a security consultant at KNPC. Uh, Joel, you're going to be doing a lot of speaking, I think. As one is for you. Um, you clearly were speaking earlier on about the capabilities of, or the lack of capabilities in the human firewall. Um, pretty sure you have an opinion about what needs to be done to educate uh, all of those participants in the value chain in what to do and what not to do. And then I have a, a secondary question to the panel, a general one. Um, can you? extract and expand on what the key characteristics are that you believe should be in a chief security officer. Thanks. Okay, Joel, you want to start off? I think the first question was directed to you. Well, the idea is, again, so like I, I deal a lot with the U.S. Homeland Security Group and it took years for them to understand the value of the integrator. Of course, now we've gotten at least the word integrator to start to show up in documents, and I'm trying to explain to them, well, in a real project lifecycle model, we have this other very significant party, which is our engineering procurement and construction contractors. And they're so active in the budget setting process, the schedule process, and usually the preliminary requirement frameworks that Oftentimes, again, it depends on the model that different end users use. As we go from project to project and, and end user to end user and even geographical region, some end users actually completely transfer the entire project execution to a third party. And those are the sites that, I mean, we don't even know where to begin on those because long before the project was typically known to the public is that decisions were made and whether they chose a contractor in Tokyo, a contractor in Houston or a contractor in London. Those decisions are very instrumental and it always comes back to you. The people in this audience are the ones that have to make it a part of your internal process because without it, and it's, you know, these people are funny because um, a lot of the outsiders that are coming into industrial security probably have no idea what an oil refinery costs, but most of you in here I'm sure do. And 5% here and 10% there and 2% and someplace else, that's unacceptable. So these are where we're trying to offer, that's the value consulting that people like me and Arjan try to offer is that we've got to get these requirements in. Because everybody knows it has to be done, but in typically, if we can't delineate what we're trying to do, it tends to be omitted. And I'll pass it over for the broader question. Okay, okay. you want to take a shot at the, the second question. Yeah, on the chief security officer, characteristics of a chief security officer, I'm relieved that you said CSO, chief security officer, instead of chief information security officer. Because first of all, we, we have a new type of officer that's going to have to look at security from a much broader perspective. So I dropped the I, you know, and you did, so thank you. I think second of all, they're going to have to be a cultural attache. They're going to have to be able to move easily between the different, you know, the, the information organization, the business corporate organization, and the, and the control or process organization. They're going to have to do it seamlessly. They're going to have to be a good communicator. I think they're going to have to have deep financial skills because of the very reason Joel's talking about. We have an opportunity for the first time to have someone that can talk about security in financial terms, in terms of impact, in terms of cost of operations. And so it would be, it would be a shame to miss that opportunity by not choosing an officer with that characteristic. And I think finally, let somebody else speak. They need to have uh, a very good, astute idea of risk and be someone who essentially is on the risk board and be able to understand both the operational risks, the brand risks, the different types of risk categories that the company faces. Um, that would be what I think of as chief characteristics. 
Yeah, I can totally agree on that one. I think it's it's a very good comment on the on the communication part because for my job I work a lot with the IT uh, officers and the, the guys at the operational technology side, the OT side. And and one of the things that I noticed is that that it's often about communication and and how to build the bridge between them because in a company there's a lot of knowledge available. <coughs> IT side has a lot of security knowledge and the OT side has a lot of process knowledge. And if you can combine that, you get a very strong and very, very um, able body to continue with uh, with cybersecurity. So you must really be a communicative guy. And on the other hand, indeed, I think it's very important uh, to be able to to combine the business and see the business aspect and how to translate that to requirements to be in your cybersecurity implementation. One of the main thing is how can you convince and how can you inform the management with measurable data from your ICS environment, ICS security environment, to be able to talk business and business consequences based upon the ICS security implementation and measurements. Anybody else? You know, I, I've helped uh, recruit some chief security officers, and I, I'd say there's three legs of the stool they've commented on. The first and most important, I think, is business and financial management. It's to have that, that business background to be able to seamlessly talk to a board of directors, the executive staff, and the entire organization and, and corporation, all the way down to the, uh, the engineer and the maintenance person on site. Uh, the second leg would be uh, information technology, cybersecurity experience, and understanding the third leg is process control. And it's bringing that all together under a strong leader who can not only drive awareness, but uh, also show leadership, as I said, from the board level all the way down to the floor. Great. I would like to add one thing to kind of play off of what Jeff said. And the one thing that I really like is with organizations that have split the I and the S, because one of the first, usually you can tell on the introductions with an organization the likelihood of success in the consolidation of IT and OT. And the one way to do that is typically to look at the organizational reporting structure. Because in general, a lot of people traditionally have placed IT under a finance type organization because it tends to be treated as an organizational cost. Where OT is almost completely opposite. OT is the revenue generating stream for an organization. So if you can't figure out how to bring the two entities together from an organizational yes. perspective, you tend to have this conflict. And that's why, again, the companies that I've seen do very well with this integration have actually separated security because security then is only focused on corporate risk management which is really what cybersecurity is. We all know that businesses have to manage risk on an hourly basis, and security is one of the many things that they have to consider. So you know, Joel, the latest Gartner research indicated that when you begin to look at it the way you're describing, almost 40% of enterprises move security out from under IT. Mm -hmm. They move them out. So they'll, they'll either go to the operating the operating officer, they'll go to the risk group, they'll go to the audit group in some cases, depending upon the kind of organization we're talking about, but it's not IT. Eric, we have about seven minutes remaining. I believe we've got one question here, and the final question will be at the rear of the room. Okay, all right, and panel, we're gonna have to keep this short and sweet. I'll have to roll it right along if we're gonna get both questions, so let's hear this question. First question right over here. Hi, well, this is Dorothy Feli again. Uh, just, uh, I need to be clear, especially from uh, uh, maintaining uh, the mobility of the whole operation, because uh, for me, what I like, and now whatever is with move, we have to maintain the whole operation. And uh, maintaining the operation, there's a huge question that is, I need just to clarify it, or I need probably an answer from, you know, somebody can uh, clarify it for me. It is, Today, as you said, you mentioned that is the, the threat is coming more from insiders or it could be from a malware rather than to the simple way of attacking as hackers or whatever. So what would be the best way to protect the organization or to, to prevent the organization without complicating the whole security within the, within the whole organization? Jeff? 
Jeff, you look like you're about to jump. Well, in. I'll just quickly say that um, one of the earlier speakers was talking, I think it was the, the gentleman from SecureWorks, has basically said there's billions of things going on, and your best defense is, you know, the onion approach, defense in depth, zoning, uh, you know, limiting the scope of any particular breach, and, uh, you know, having your policies and procedures in place. And on top of that, also have your monitoring in depth because yeah. you can defend, but you really have to know what is going on in your network to be able to understand, well, what is going on. So, Joel. To help kind of get that ball rolling, that's why one of the primary concepts I like to teach is to move to a completely risk-based approach to security. As soon as you start to look at risk in terms of a threat, consequence, vulnerability perspective, and you remove the people element, it becomes very clear. Because one of the first things you have to do is categorize and classify your risk. And as soon as you start to rank risk, all of a sudden you're going to find out that the, the areas that you're going to put your emphasis on would not necessarily be those that would be the external vectors, so to speak. So you would start to look at your internal assets, your internal logical associations, and move from there. And I think it really helps not overcomplicate because it takes the, the human factor out. It becomes very, very easy to, to do this based on an overall risk classification. Okay, and we have time for one more question. I think uh, somebody already has the mic back here. All right, let's hear that question. Oh, this is Christy, the panelist. Uh, specific question since your topic is about uh, cyber uh, trends in technology. Uh, my question is, uh, see the ACS is moving very quickly towards the wireless and uh, virtualization. Do you have any specific security envelope advices for the audience? Can you ask the question again? I, we didn't it's about any specific security envelopes for the wireless and uh, virtualization. Uh, sp specific security guidance for wireless. Is that and correct? virtualization. And virtualization? Oh. Ooh. Okay. Well, I'll take the wireless part. I'll take the authorization. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> in the area of wireless, wireless is a big word and doesn't mean anything. So you've got wireless sensor networks, you've got wireless, you've got Wi-Fi, you've got RFID chips, you've got trunking radios, you've got all sorts of stuff. So I guess I'll limit my answer to uh, the wireless sensor network and the, what I would call the wireless plant network, in other words, the Wi-Fi, because those are the two really biggies. So at the sensor level, um, I, you know, if you go with one of the modern standards, whether it's wireless heart or .11a, um, you're, you're, in, you're already in really good shape, in my opinion. Now, that's because I helped design both of them, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of commonality there, and as I alluded to earlier, you've got a really robust joint process, you've got good encryption, and it's always encrypted, and you've got end-to-end -end, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, confidentiality. Very, it's going to be the strongest, in my opinion, again, uh, communications in terms of security in your plant. It, at the Wi-Fi level, that's a classic example where the plant people need to get your IT people involved because the IT people know how to make a secure Wi-Fi. Th that's one of the big things that they know how to do. And there's no reason to invent anything new. They've got it nailed down, whether you use Cisco, whatever. I mean, Wi-Fi is not a mystery. mystery. Sorry. And you did say authorization, right? It wasn't virtualization, it was authorization. Was it authorization or virtualization? It's about the virtualization. Authorization. authorization. Virtualization. 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 Okay. I don't know as much about virtualization as authorization. I think on the virtualized side, we're starting to see the, also the advantage of having the IT security people become involved, those specifically that are involved in cloud computing technology, because most of the cloud service providers, they use virtualization technology and then they have to go about figuring out ways to secure those environments. So we are seeing some technological advances in secure virtualization. 
Um, some of that can be implemented at the process level, but remember, you're dealing with something completely different when you start talking about process control systems. Most of the virtualization advances that we're talking about, they're either IT, the IT portion of, let's say, an oil company, or they are, um, in some cases, the use of virtualization may be in the management systems of the, the process environment. It's still using traditional IT style technologies, but you may use virtualization in that case to do some sandboxing, or you may use it in a testing environment so that you'd be able to test. And I know that some of the technologies for malware are now using some virtualization technologies to be able to hold and explode, or they call it detonate, um, malware within a controlled environment to discover the effects so that they can then turn and use in the product. And I know Joel is chomping at the bit to comment about virtualization. Just five seconds. The one thing, I've been asked by several vendors to review their security documents regarding virtualization, and the one thing that they pretty consistently missed, you have to realize your hypervisor is now an active host. Because as you move things into the virtual world, now the attacker is going to go after the hypervisor because once you've hypervised the hypervisor, you tend to have everything that's resting on it. So the one piece of advice I always have is always remember that there is something underneath those virtual machines. And the same thing with your network. And with that, I'll take it uh, back Ariane, to you. Ariane, yes. And then I'll take two more seconds to add one final thing to the one. <laughs> Sorry, now that we guys. Know it's virtualization. Now we yeah, know. She's going to hurt you. She's gonna hurt you. <laughs> Two seconds. Now for the wireless part, I think it's very important for new technology also to look at the business need for it. Because I've seen customers uh, say, well, okay, let's not use cable, let's just go wireless because, well, then we don't have to lay a cable for like 15 meters. And in that case, perhaps you can avoid looking at security risks with uh, wireless and just go for a plain old cable installed. Look at the business need. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause to our panelists and to our moderator, Eric. Didn't you gentlemen do well? Do you see how quickly 60 minutes goes when you're having such fun? I'm going to actually ask my gentleman to remain on the stage because we actually have a little something for you and our other guests. So, ladies and gentlemen, may I please invite onto the stage um, Ahmed al Shwebi, who is the Director of Operations at Equate. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ahmed onto the stage. Um, Ahmed is going to be awarding the first five, and then I'm going to be inviting Mohammed al Bakri on stage. Um, Ahmed, could I ask you to, to take one of these, show the audience the million dollar uh, placard that's being awarded to our first gentleman? It is, of course, Eric Byers. These are a small token of appreciation, gentlemen, for all your hard work and indeed for coming halfway across the world to join us. Our next one is to Jeff Zindel. <laughs> Jeff Potter. Arjan Maija. Joel Langill. Earl Perkins. <laughs> the 
Don Smith. Um, Don Smith, well, I think it should be given to me personally. I mean, if he's not here to collect his million dollar check, I think it should come to the ladies. We're going to get that over to Don. Can I also invite onto stage Mohammed Al Bakri, who is the IT leader at Equate? Welcome, Mohammed. <laughs> May we please invite on stage Ahmed Al Malafi? <laughs> These are placards of appreciation, gentlemen, from Equate. Iyad al -Kaidi. <laughs> and Peter Reynolds. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the 10 placards of appreciation on behalf of Equate. And may I invite Ahmed Al Shwebi back onto the stage to join Mohammed because we have the draw. It's 5.15 and three people are luckily going to be walking away with an iPad and an iPhone. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to our panelists and thank you to our moderator. Thank you, gentlemen. You may, of course, remain here on stage to see the draw winners, or you may return to your seats wherever you are most comfortable. <laughs> They're settled in for the night. <laughs> okay, so, um, Ahmed and Mohammed, are you ready to give away some iPads and some iPhones? Fabulous. How is this going to work, ladies and gentlemen? Well, we basically have an automated system that's going to be working from the back. Everybody that registered to come today to the conference is automatically going to be selected. But you have to be in the room to win one of these three prizes. So, Don Smith, you're already out. <laughs> All the more for the remainder of us. So, gentlemen, are you ready? Christy, are you ready to roll those numbers? Ladies and gentlemen, keep looking at the screens. We are looking for names. Tomorrow, we may need to consider a bowl and business cards. Amit Basin, are you here? Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Amit. Congratulations. Come and collect your prize. Gentlemen, can we roll the next one, please? Congratulations to Amit. Thrilled that you were here. Yasa Ilyas. Oh, Yasa, well done. You have won yourself the second iPad, and well done for being here, because as we said, the rules of the lucky draw is you luckily need to be here. Congratulations and well done to you. And gentlemen, may we roll the final winner, please. Vincent Lynch. Vincent, oh, thank goodness. Well done, Vincent. Vincent, you are walking home with the very latest iPhone. So congratulations to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that simple. Two iPhones, uh, sorry, two iPads and one iPhone today. Congratulations, Vincent. And of course, the rules are you need to be here. 
So congratulations to all of our winners today. So ladies and gentlemen, remember that the buses are leaving for the hotels outside the main doors in the car park. And of course, those are for the Marina Hotel, the Missoni, the Symphony, and the Radisson Blue. Many thanks to our panelists, many thanks to our moderators and our speakers, and of course, you all. And do remember, ladies and gentlemen, that your bus pickup is at 07.30 tomorrow morning, and registration opens at 7.30. Ladies and gentlemen, we wish you a very pleasant evening. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC.